Um, well, we thought we'd start with a little biography of yes. Quinn Epperly. Um, he was uh, born in, in Virginia in uh, 1913. He um, uh, didn't uh, didn't have a big interest in in auto racing. He he uh, wanted to be a uh, to do automotive body work and. Uh, took a correspondence course, which uh, was something that happened in those days. And uh, the prize for being the best student uh, was a, a, a job interview with uh, Lockheed Aviation in California. And he won it. So in, in 41, 1941, he went to California and um, uh, interviewed and was hired at, at Lockheed. They figured out pretty quickly that he was an extraordinarily good welder. And uh, so he never did any actual body work at that point, although he was subsequently did. Uh, but he was the, the go-to welder for Lockheed Aircraft Company. <laughs> and uh, that after the war was over, he uh, answered an ad from Curtis Craft, which was Frank Curtis, Curtis's uh, then brand new race car building factory in Glendale. Uh, the first Indy car that he worked on was the was the then new Novi, the front wheel drive Novi. Uh, they ultimately built two. And um, you know, worked on all manner of things at Curtis's for the next four or five years, um, and uh, and then through circumstance uh, was uh, at Indianapolis, which common practice in those days was for the. The shops to sort of close up, and people would, the, 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 the guys, the fabricators and whatnot, would, would go back to Indy for the month of May and um, often work to repair wrecks and, you know, keep, keep the show on the road. <clears throat> and uh, he did that and uh, ended up with Merle Bellinger's team. Um, and uh, they won the race in, in 1951 with Lee Waller, and uh, anyway, that car uh, became the catalyst for, for him being a race car builder as opposed to an employee at Frank Curtis's. And uh, so he and Luigi Lozowski, another prominent builder, uh, formed a company. and. Uh, Lazowski and Epperly race car engineering. They're on Figueroa Street in Los Angeles. And uh, they built a, a couple of cars and uh, that were quite good. One of won the national championship uh, with Henry Banks driving. Um, but uh, Luigi and, and Quinn were, were pretty different characters. E equally wonderful guys, but different. And uh, so they kind of split up, and at that point, Quinn started his own business. And uh, his, his sole employee was, was a guy named Everett Duncan, who had been with him, worked with him at, at Curtis's. And uh, uh, between the two of them, it, it would be hard to find a, a better pair of, of fabricators, welders, aluminum, body makers, uh, they were just extraordinary. And uh, uh, one of their projects that um, made quite a bit of, of, uh, of, of press, although it never actually raced, was a, a new revolutionary car for a, a car owner, Howard Keck. Keck cars with Bill Vukovic driving had won Indy in 53 and 54 
this car was going to be built for the 55 race. Um, and it was a, a, a quite a radical, fully streamlined body with a, 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 a wing-like flap on the back that was driver adjustable, uh, a, um, a, a closed cockpit. I mean, it, it was really quite something, and, and a, a different manner of, of construction for the frame. Um, not so much different construction, but different design. And uh, the car was actually designed by a guy named Norman Timms. And, uh, but anyway, Quinn and, and, and Everett were building this thing. They were supposed to have a new V8 supercharged engine that was sort of a generation two Novi, I guess, that uh, Leo Goosen and, and Travers Coons, the two mechanics, that worked for Keck, uh, later to become Traco, uh, were, were building the engine. Well, as it turned out, the, the engine was never finished, the car was never finished, Vukovic got killed, and the whole thing kind of rolled to a halt. Um, and uh, so that car is, is uh, currently uh, under a, a can't really call it restoration because uh, it was never finished. But um, th that's kind of the, the work order says uh, complete in the way that that Quinn Epperly would have completed it. So it's, it's an interesting job. But that's kind of another story. Um, but that got up to '56, and then for the '57 race at Indy, um, Quinn built his first car, which was the Chiropractic Special. It was uh, driven by Jim Rathman and uh, ended up finishing second. Uh, the winning car that year, driven by Sam Hanks, was one that Quinn built the body and the tanks and uh, you know, had some input in, but it was, it was not his design. The car was designed, uh, substantially built and owned by a guy named George Sally. George was an incredibly good mechanic. He won Indy in, in 51. Um, and uh, he was the shop foreman at Meyer and Drake, the people that built the Offenhauser engine. And he had the idea to lay the engine over on its side, lower the car. And uh, so Quinn was involved with that car. He's often credited with having built it, but he'd be the first to say he did not build it. And it was George's idea. And he and George were friends. And uh, you know, he was very quick to give credit where it belonged on that one. Um, but he really liked the design. And, and, and uh, his arrangements with, with George Sally was that he could sort of copy, or at least take advantage of, of the design for his own cars in subsequent years, which, which he did. So in 57, he built his own first car, finished second, had a hand in the winning car. And then in 58, um, the George Sally car won again with Jimmy Bryan driving. And um, Quinn had two other cars in the race that finished second and fourth. Um, and, uh, you know, he was kind of off and running. And uh, ultimately he built seven cars. They were all a lay-down configuration of one sort or another, save the very first one, that chiropractic special was more conventional. Um, and uh, it was kind of a frustrating career for him, I think, because um, they were clearly the best cars at certain points. Um, Parnelli Jones would tell you today that the 1960 Autolite Special that he drove, which was a Quinn Appley design, was the best race car he ever drove in his life. And, um, he said, if I'd, won, if I'd had that car, I'd have won Indy four times on the trot. You know. 
well, we'll, we'll never know. <laughs> but I think uh, uh, there was a funny thing that happened with uh, uh, the cars were built um, mostly in Los Angeles by, by one of five people, um, A.J. Watson, Frank Curtis, Eddie Kuzma, mm -hmm. Luigi Lazowski, and Quinn Epperly. They built 90% of all the roadster kind of cars. And um, other than Watson, the guys built the cars, handed them off to the team, that may or may not have been any good, and, and they set them up the way they wanted to do it. They made their modifications, they put their engines in it, and the guy that built and designed it never had any direct input into how the car was raced and how it was set up for the racing. And that was always a frustration for Quinn. Um, and I always thought that it was a, Watson's advantage, because Watson was his own chief mechanic, and um, went to all the races and was able to move and change and modify and do what it took to make it better every subsequent week, you know. Anyway, um, Quinn's uh, output was, was relatively small, he, like I say, seven cars were, were was his deal. Um, the last one was a uh, the the Max and Jeffries car, which was a a very unique design in '67. Uh, it was like a uh, he called it a truss beam axle car. It was essentially still a roadster, but it had the engine almost amidships. Um, alongside the driver, engine here, driver here. Um, the two axles were not conventional solid axles, they were a DDM arrangement. So they, they, they could adjust camber and uh, toe and everything else ind you know, independently. Um, and uh, it was a way of coping with the ever widening tires that, that were happening at that point, and um, keeping a, a, a flat, keeping the, the, the tire in, in the best contact with the with the road possible. Um, and that was a, a a very very good car. You know, got very positive. Uh, reviews from the drivers, uh, but it, it, it was kind of crippled by less than good engines and, um, you know, just a, not enough budget, <laughs> which is, you know, like so many racing things. Um, Quinn also built uh, the Craig Breedlove uh, Spirit of America, the, the tricycle one, and uh, uh, that was uh, a pretty big deal, um, and uh, it, it, it ultimately was uh, maybe not as successful as it might have been, but um, it was it was a, a, certainly a, a spectacular car. And after that, I think that was pretty much his last racing car, and, and uh, but he became the go-to guy for fixing any piece of metal that you mangled up by the way that racers can always mangle up a piece of metal. Um, and uh, he set up a little shop in Gardena and, and uh, he had uh, one of my favorite stories, uh, and actual experiences, because he did it. One of the things that Quinn could do was repair aluminum engine blocks. In, in the late 60s, early 1970 really, uh, Chevrolet introduced a, a aluminum block for the big 500 cubic inch racing Can-Am car engines. And uh, 
of course, they had more than enough power to hurt themselves, which they did regularly. And uh, that's how I first met Quinn, was, was getting him to stitch a one of 494 rounds block back together. <clears throat> and uh, he could do it so well and so non-invasively that you didn't have to remachine the damn thing. And I don't know to this day how he was able to do that. Um, but it was uh, it was just spectacular, and, and and he subsequently did all manner of, of Cosworth engines, which were sort of the mainstay engine for any Indianapolis racing through the 80s, um, and uh, so he uh, Tom Joe, one of the all-time heroes of Southern California racing. Uh, said one time, when Quinn Epperly dies, the cost of racing is going to go up. And he was absolutely correct. Because um, uh, he, he couldn't save it anymore. Because the guy that could save him was gone. Um, but he uh, uh, did that work. He, he, he was, uh, sub after he closed his own shop, he kind of moved in with, with John Rodak. Rodak built the aluminum Chevy and, and later Chrysler versions of <coughs> uh, sprint car and dragster engines. And he built aluminum blocks and um, so that was a, a nice comfortable home for, for Quinn and, and he, uh, he and John were, were good pals and that worked out well. Uh, Rodak subsequently moved to Paso Robles and Quinn went with him and that's where he lived out the remainder of his life. Um, he was uh, my uh, experience uh, with him was always pretty magical. Uh, he just was somebody that was one of the great people. He was, a, he was a wonderful guy who nobody ever had a hint of a bad thing to say about. Um, he always had a smile on his face and uh, he was uh, supremely talented and uh, never, never would cop to it, you know. <laughs> so anybody can do this, which was not the case at all.